Ronnie Harris, good evening. Down in the state of Georgia, the Peach State. Uh, Ronnie Harris, welcome. Good evening. What are you up to? You've been fishing? Got any good fish reports? Anything good that's going on? I'd love to hear. Let us know. Y'all chime in. Let me Everybody let me know, first of all, where you're from. If you've been catching fish or if you've been fishing, I'm always, always love knowing about, you know, what everybody else is doing in other states right now. I know down in Georgia, you're further south than I am. All of our lakes are somewhere around, you know, in the upper 40s, mid 40s. Um, I'm always just kind of curious about that, what what everybody else is doing right now. we got seven people watching. Everybody let us know. Glenn Outdoors, how's it going, Glenn? Ain't seen you for a while. We are, I painted up some 32nd ounce jigs. We're going to tie some of these up this evening while we're talking. Benton, Arkansas. I've been fishing Lake Nimrod lately. Doing any good? Any big ones? Small ones? Love hearing that. And all you guys are on YouTube. Chazzy Daddy Outdoors. Howdy ho, neighbor. Southeast Kansas, low water and tough bite. We got really low water around here, too. And last weekend, we had a pretty tough bite. Uh, yeah, I was on Palmy, Palm de Terror Saturday. And, man, I was, I got whipped so bad. I don't even think I turned the radio on on the way home. I was, like, emotional. Like, tears and stuff. Randy Schaefer, good evening. I got all your jigs packed up, getting ready to ship out. I'll be shipping them out tomorrow when I get home from work. I'll stop by the post office and get them. Get them in the mail to you. All sizes, but love the lake. Well, all sizes ain't bad. I mean, it's it's kind of fun. It makes your day go by a little bit longer. It makes your trip on the lake last a little bit longer if you're you're catching some that are keepers, some aren't keepers. You know, back and forth, some stuff like that. I always kind of like that. I just it's, it's kind of disappointing sometimes when you go to the lake and boom, you catch 15, 11 inch fish, and then your day's over with. Um, you know, you can keep on fishing, but it just, I like, I like kind of weeding through them, like hunting them down, finding the small ones, working up to the big ones, some nine, 10 inch fish and an occasional, you know, 11, 12, 13 inch crappie. It just make, makes, makes your day last better, last longer. Feels like you got a little more out of it. You know what I mean? Um, but. We're going to get some jigs going. Super Finn, Northwest Louisiana. Good evening, bud. Wayman Wade. Yes, sir. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do a redhead with chartreuse feathers, and I'm going to do pink on the neck. Yep, water temperature was 48 degrees Saturday. And I think we started out, it was air temperature was like... 41 or 42 but it got up to 60 degrees that day and we had all that heavy rain getting ready to come in which is i'm blaming that on not catching any fish i'm not but it wasn't my fault it wasn't the boat's fault it was the weather it, it just it, it definitely wasn't our fault no way that's my opinion on it zach was in the truck beside me and he agreed too we left and you see big old rain clouds building up on the west so i said that's why we didn't catch no fish I think it'll work pretty good. Red, purple neck, and chartreuse feathers. I'm just about out of purple. I don't know if I got enough. I'm on the top six red ones and six chartreuse ones. Um, but it was, it was it was kind of odd. We were fishing in a spot where there was usually a lot of boats, and uh, we was there two hours, and you know I noticed the boats running down the lake. And nobody was coming back into where we were fishing at, which is, like I said, odd because there's usually tons of boats back in that spot. Robert Page, Gene Page from Seabring, Florida. It's a good time of year to be in Florida. Nasty here. It's been nasty here all week. I ain't really sure about the weekend. I, ain't, I think Saturday was like the only day that looked like it'd be able to get the boat out. Or the only day I would. It's in the 40s. Uh, five to ten mile an hour wind. <clears throat> so Saturday might be our open opportunity to get back out on the water and try to redeem ourselves. We left Saturday and it actually gave me a complex. I was kind of worried about it. 
everybody's had those days where it just feels like you just got it handed to you. Uh, but anyway, we was fishing in that cove, and boats were just flying past us. They were going up further up the lake, and I told Zach, I said, let's, let's go see where everybody else is going, because we wasn't doing any good. We've been back in this cove for like two hours. We had one bite. We pulled some crankbaits across the mouth of it, crossed some brush piles, nothing. Pulled jigs, nothing. Uh, even single pulled with minnows, nothing. So we ran a little further up the lake, and we got a little way up the lake, and there was probably 40 boats all stacked in the bend. And if you fish Palmetier Lake, it's the bend. That's where they were fishing at. But they wasn't catching nothing. They were all they were all sitting there, boats side by side, and just all staring at that uh, live scope. But for the hour and a half, two hours we were at that spot, I've never seen anybody pulling a fish, calling for snow again in the morning. As long as I don't mind the snow, as long as it hits the ground and does not stick. I'm perfectly happy with that. That, that just tickles me to death. As long as it hits the ground, it looks like it's been raining. That is the kind of snow I like that don't last so i don't know what the temperature is supposed to get tonight i don't know if it'd make the make the ground freeze or not or stick to the ground i'd say probably not but it snowed the other day it was snowing. i think it was snowing a little bit when i got up this morning what speed were you pulling crankbaits i was using really super small crankbaits i mean like an inch long about 18 inches above that, I had a egg sinker. I had them down to about 15 foot where we were seeing some of the schools at, and I was pulling right at about a mile an hour. Floyd, hello, Eric. Guess you were talking about fishing last Saturday. Yeah, I'm talking about fishing last Saturday. I told Zach, I said, we get home. I said, if there's a bunch of people posting pictures of all these fish they caught, I'm on I'm going to be upset, and there wasn't. There wasn't. It didn't look like hardly anybody. I think I seen one post of a guy that said uh, they had fished all day, and I think caught like six or seven or eight or something like that, so it didn't make me feel quite so bad. But we had stuff to do back home. I was going to get some jerky smoke in, and so it didn't really hurt my feelings. But man, we didn't catch nothing. I mean, it was it was bad. To me, it was. But that's the way it goes. That's why it's called fishing and not catching. But we did. We pulled uh, we pulled crankbaits. We pulled jigs. We single pulled jigs on the trees. Single pulled minnows. And one one good hard bite we got the first fifteen minutes we were there. And. Uh, that was it. That was all we caught. Ron said from KY3 he said it might be on the bridges. That's about it. No, that ain't so bad. Bold Wolfing. Good evening. I'm going to be 31 in the morning. May call in. <laughs> no work. Me too. You call in, I'm calling in too. Might be pretty treacherous trying to get there. Chris Harris, going pretty good, man. How are you this evening? Chris, where are you from? Byron Anderson, hello from Shelbyville, Indiana. It's 34 degrees here. Burr. I live pretty close. I lived in Kentucky. We lived uh, in Brandenburg, so I wasn't real far away from Indiana, just pretty much right across the bridge. We did some fishing in the Indiana. We'd fish uh, Potoka Lake, and there was a couple small little lakes we'd used to fish in Indiana quite a bit. Potoka Lake was a cool lake. It was a big old lake, too. Modot was out full force today in Springfield. I seen them out yesterday on Highway 13 on my way home from work. I bet I passed. They were all going south on 13, and I want to say there was like three salt trucks that I seen out to salt down the wet black top yesterday on my way home r and h jigs good evening good evening sir how are you 
R and H G. That sounds familiar. You got a Facebook page or a TikTok page or something like that. Seems like I've heard that before. These are pretty simple little jigs or uh, one thirty second ounce with a number eight hook, just regular straight old J hook. Keeping them pretty simple this evening. Very well from Oklahoma. What lakes you fish at in Oklahoma? Grand Cherokee. A lot of pretty good lakes in Oklahoma. You see a lot of pictures of a lot of good fish coming out of some of those lakes. Mike Kilman, how are you tonight, sir? How many people we got watching? 22? That ain't doing too bad. I don't know if there's any way to share this to get more people watching, but that's not too bad. Anybody got plans on fishing this weekend? Glenn, you been doing any fishing? Sometimes I like these little simple jigs. These are the ones that actually got me into tying jigs. Uh, after my dad had died, I accumulated all his tackle that he had over the years. And in one of those tackle boxes, he had some of those old school Popeye jigs. And uh, just a simple little jig with a little bit of uh, painted jig head and with a little bit of a neck and just a couple feathers and a heady big old eyes painted on them and I found some of those and they were actually we called them Popeye jigs I don't know what the actual name of them was in uh, <clears throat> that's what got me into tying jigs I wanted to make those I want the Bass Pro to go buy some and all they had was like these pastel looking colors and I wanted some bright ones so um, I started making my own I bought a vice and learned how to do my own nope I didn't airbrush my vice it was actually spray paint um thought I sanded it down good enough to get it to stick, but it didn't. It looks like it's been through worn back, but actually it has. It's tied thousands of jigs. I need, I thought about taking it up to a body shop up here down the road from us and seeing if I could get them to airbrush it, but I was afraid that it wouldn't all go back together right, so <clears throat> I just kind of did it myself. Chris Harris says he fishes 10 Killer Lake and you follow. One thing about I would love to fish 10 Killer Lake because I would think eventually sometime, some point, You'd probably end up running into Jimmy Houston. Jimmy Houston, I know, was big time on Ten Killer Lake. Can't do the can't. Fit. Floyd says he don't do the cold weather anymore. I don't. There's a very fine line between when I go and when I don't go. I can fish from in the 40s if the wind's not blowing. I can. I'm. I'm okay if the wind's higher than that. It's in the 40s. I'm. I'm probably not going to go. Five to ten mile an hour winds, 40 degrees. Um, I will I will go, but any colder than that, it's it's pretty rough. I did a guide trip last year, and when I put the boat in the water, it was 19 degrees out. Um, but it was one of those days the sun come up, there was no wind blowing, and it was actually fairly comfortable once it started warming up, and I think it warmed up into like mid-30s, something like that. But I don't remember being, you know, freezing cold. BFE said did some fishing today, caught a good mess of bluegill and shell crackers. Shell crackers and bluegill. Man, I'm <clears throat> I wish we had a good lake around here with shell crackers and bluegill. Or just the bluegill. I'd be happy with just that. Uh, <clears throat> don't run into very many good bluegill lakes around here anymore. Uh, Mike Coleman says on Lake Martin camping. Nope, I haven't been out on Stockton. I should have. I, we got there, and I told Zach, I said, I wish we would have went to Stockton and walleye fished instead of going to Palm Hill crappie fishing. Last weekend, that when we went out that day, it was overcast. It was still, uh, I think it would have made a probably. I'm saying that just because I wasn't there, but I think it probably would have made a pretty good walleye fishing day. And I debated it. And I was like, nope, I'm going after crappie. I need some more crappie in my freezer before winter time. Bluegill are almost a nuisance. We have so many around here. He's in Tennessee. BFE, FPB. 
they can be a nuisance here sometimes. Sometimes you get into those little bitty small ones that want to peck everything. But you never really run into good eating size bluegill here anywhere. A couple times we we caught a couple on Stockton Lake one time dragging crankbaits, but um, it just you know it was total total accident. Total accident. Uh, Yeah, if the sun is shining, I agree. Chris here, so I used to see him a lot. My son played baseball in Fort Gibson. He used to sponsor some of the teams. He did a video on that one time, and he was talking about that sponsoring. He Didn't he own an insurance company or something like that, too? Send me a pick on Messenger. When I get off here, I'll check that picture out. Uh, RNH jig is I got some UV resin for Christmas and it changed the whole jig. It felt like it does. The UV resin will take your jig to a whole new level, a whole different look. Um, there wasn't a lot of people doing it. I'm not sure how many, you know, if there was hardly anybody doing it when I, when I started doing it. Uh, and what had brought that up is I was watching this video of this guy. It was on YouTube, and I cannot remember the guy's name. And I seen a video one time, and I never seen it again. But he was, he was overseas somewhere, and uh, had this big mahogany table, and he was smoking a pipe. And he had this really fancy vice out, and he had this hook, and the camera was zoomed in just right. And the guy was talking the whole time he was tying, and he took this hook and he turned it into some. So, I mean, just bugging and just had me totally mesmerized watching this guy do this. Um, and when he got done down to the very end, he got this stuff in this bottle and he put a little drop on it and he got a light out and he held that light on for a few seconds. And, uh, it, you know, he, he said that was how he sealed it on, but he didn't tell me what it was. And my wife was sitting there. I was like, what in the world did he just put on that? And she's like, what are you talking about? And I rewound it and played it. And she, she watched it. She's like, well, I'm pretty sure that's the same stuff they use when you go get your fingernails done. They paint this clear stuff on your nails, and then they put them underneath the light and it hardens. So I got to looking it up, and there was other fly tires doing the same thing, and I found out it was UV resin. And I started out using the UV resin just on behind the head where the knot was, and I'd cure it. Well, I was playing with it one day, and I made the head look like it had a big old hook on the side of it with the UV resin and all that. And... Um, I was like halfway through tying a jig. I had the hackle on. I had the neck tied up and got busy doing something and came back and I got to look at that jig. And I was like, well, it look, might look kind of cool if I just put the UV resin on it like that. So I put the UV resin on and cured it. And it just, I, I love the way it looked. Uh, there was a whole different look with that crappie jig than what I was seeing from anywhere else. And the, I put one in a jar of water. And I, sh I should have done a video on it. I should have done like a time-lapse video on it. That jig hung in a mason jar full of water for over a year. I pulled it back out and I scratched and I still couldn't get my fingernail underneath that UV resin. I coated them with UV resin. I cured them really, really good. And this is no kidding. I put it in a slingshot. I didn't pull it all the way back, but I put it in a slingshot and shot it against the foundation and up here in front of the house on it and it didn't chip the paint. So... The UV resin also, to me, made the paint more durable on the jig head. If it's all cured right and it's all set up good, the only thing I've really used an oven for anymore is just to kind of blend my paints together. When I got like two or three different color paints on my jig head, I'll put them in that oven for like 10 minutes at like 285 degrees, which on the setting says 285, but the oven thermometer inside says 315. And then I just get the, uh, let it blend the paint in. Then I use the UV resin to finish everything else off. Um, BFE, Floyd Lawrence County, Tommy Ward, hello, Eric from Newman, Georgia. And Floyd, we were talking about Real Foot last week. I, I would talk about Real Foot Lake all night long. One place I, is, I'd really like to see that happen this year, Real Foot Lake, to make a trip down there. I'm kind of scared of taking this big boat down there, though, because I know, I've tore up three props on um, real foot, and that's not even, I wasn't even like full throttle. I wasn't even quarter throttle, uh, just pretty much just putting around the lake and some of those cypress stumps. 
And, and if you've ever fished like this guy Cypress Stumps in it, you know what I'm talking about. It's like hitting a concrete pillar. We moved down here from northwest Indiana to get away from the cold and the snow. Did a lot of salmon fishing on Lake Michigan. But I will take crappie fishing anytime. I would I would try to talk my wife into packing up and let's move into Florida to get away from the snow and cold. Try that's like a, a weekly debate at my house. Let's pack up and leave. Dang burgers good. Uh, but yeah, it's like when you hit a cypress stump with your boat, and even back then, the boat I had, I had a, uh, I think it was a 16 foot tracker pro team 17 or something like that. And it did not have uh power tilt and trim. So that was one thing that made it a little bit better was I could unlock the motor. And when I hit a stump, it would just raise the motor up out of the water and just drop it back down. But I still ended up tearing up three, one trip I went through two props, and then the next time we went, I tore a prop up, and I had to end up getting a prop on the way back to Kentucky. Um, it can them cypress stumps are crazy. If you if you ever make it down there, uh, and you can't really even pay attention to what the locals were doing, because those guys were driving in full throttle across there. You know, you can kind of get an idea about where they, where they went, but man, that was just a rough lake on a boat. But it was the most scenic lake. I have ever fished. I've never fished a lake where we were bluegill fishing. And that's all we went down there for was the bluegill. Uh, bluegill fishing and you, we get ourselves back up in those cypress trees where it was shady. It was just a beautiful place to fish at. And, and within three days, there was three of us. We had, we had planned on staying there all week. We had caught and filleted as many crappie as we could probably eat in a year. Bluegill as we could probably eat in a year, and we left after three days. But, man, it was it was a beautiful lake. Glenn Outdoors says he hates the cold on my legs after I got shot. But, uh, my feet, when my feet get cold, I'm done. When they get to that point where I'm that uncomfortable, I'm done. So I take, uh, I probably got, I think I got a whole box of hand warmers in the boat. So when I get on the lake, I'll get those hand warmers too. Four hand warmers going, and I put one in the bottom of my shoe and one on top of my foot, and put my foot back in my shoe just to try to keep my feet warm. So two hand warmers on each shoe, inside each shoe, maybe whatever I got on, uh, just to try to keep me my feet from driving me crazy. I can kind of live with my hands being really, really cold, but, man, when my feet get cold, I'm done. Over and if you're not catching any fish, you it seems like you feel the cold 10 times worse. 34, yeah, it was like 30, I think that's what it was when I left here this morning to go to work, was in the low 30s. Took him 40 years to get his wife out of Indiana and move south. You know, I'd like to convince him to do it here in the next couple of years. Um, it just it seems like it's, you know, got to be easier on you winter times are just rough and after i lived in iowa for 10 years i don't i don't care if i see another winter ever again tell you true if you fish up on the north end of real foot you can find eight to ten foot but it's the same with the stumps yeah we was up pretty close to that we didn't go down there and stay in that blue bank but we was pretty close to blue bank we had to take it take one of those ditches take that ditch to get to the other side of the lake and we was end up fishing lily pads but we'd go through that ditch every morning cut across the lake through the woods and go over that side and fish. There was a big wide open spot just full of lily pads. And we, we just hammered bluegill all for three solid days out of those lily pads. And we ended up catching, we catch bluegill, crappie, largemouth, channel cats. Uh, and most of the time, like I said, we went after bluegill. So we had like pretty much crickets and red worms and we caught everything on those crickets. The crappie would devour those crickets, you know. I'm pretty sure it was just we was there that right time of year. Uh, I think it was like right before June. Robert Page, he said his wife recognizes that voice. Well, good. I'm glad I'm on here enough where people recognize my voice. Bull Wolf and 29 of us here hit that thumbs up. Thank you, Bull. Appreciate that. Um, But y'all give me y'all's opinion on forward face of sonar. What do y'all think about it? 
I was watching. I mean, I watch YouTube videos a lot. I'm pretty much that's about the only thing I watch. And I hear a lot of. It seems like here lately, it's a lot of people saying negative stuff about it more so than positive stuff. One other lake I like to fish too. I like to go back up and fish Leech Lake in Minnesota one more time too. That was fun. RNH Jigs. He's from Fordland, a minute in Fordland, Missouri. R and H. I know who R and H is. I know you now. I know exactly who. Lake Fork. Yeah, I wouldn't mind a fish Lake Fork. Lake Fork would be a good one, too. Um, and I hear it's about the same way. It's another kind of like Truman, except for probably even worse than that. What I would like to see Truman do is, well, I'd say to mark the, the boating lanes, but the channel and Truman, if you've got a little bit of knowledge on how a lake lays out, what to expect, you know, Truman's not really that bad to navigate. If you got GPS on your boat and you can, you know, got some kind of mapping system on there, it makes Truman a whole lot easier to fish. But I heard, I've heard Fork is not that way. I've heard Fork is uh, just kind of different to drive on, is what I heard. Forward face sonars, love, hate. Love it if you have it, hate it if you don't. Yeah, that's true too. I've heard that that seems to be the thing. It seems like it changes the way people fish. It just, you know, you don't you don't run into people now that are so willing to, you know, just sit there and talk. RNH, you're about lazy hikes. I've never fished in the state of Georgia. Never have. I don't think I've ever fished in Alabama either. What uh, what lakes do you fish in Georgia? I'm going somewhere on a trip somewhere this year. I ain't sure yet where, but I'm pretty sure it's probably going to be real foot. My wife loves to catch bluegill, and I'd rather do a trip like that when she's with me. And I think she would absolutely have a blast catching some of those big bluegill they catch in on real foot. Richland Chambers and Cedar Creek in Texas are pretty good. I hand tied. Number eight hooks. Love your show. Thank you. 007, Dr. Price. Is that how you say that? I'm glad you watched. Thank you for watching. You have no idea how much I appreciate that. I love getting those comments where people are thanking me for something. And somebody sent me a message the other day and wanted to know what I thought about some jigs that he had tied up. And I told that message totally disappeared. I don't know where it went. And I feel like the guy probably like, man, they must have thought those were pretty bad. He never even responded to it. I totally lost the message. It was gone. So if you're on here uh, and you send me that, I, I promise you I didn't blow it off. I, I'll give everybody my opinion. They send me a picture of their jigs, what I think about them. Um, if I like them or if I think the tail needs to be longer, shorter, whatever, I promise you I will give you my opinion on those and i'll get a lot of people that ask me questions about selling jigs you know what's what's the best way to go about doing it um, go into it slow be ready because you can turn a fun hobby into a seven day a week job because that's what i did for a for one solid year straight every single day i tied jigs every single day and i was still always behind on orders i ended up with my uh oldest daughter helping me um Zach helped me for a long time, and he still does. If something's going on, I need to get some stuff moved out. Zach will come down here, and he'll paint up all my jig heads for me. What's up, Melvin? How's it going tonight? Uh, not this Friday, tomorrow, but Friday the next, I'll be doing a podcast on uh, 105.1 The Bull in Springfield, Missouri with Ray Michaels. So if – if you could tune into that, tune into that. That'll be next Friday when I get off work. I'm going to meet him at the radio station, and we're going to do a podcast there. That's I'm pretty sure it's like broadcast over Springfield and all that. But I talked to him yesterday, and we've scheduled that for next Friday. Um, February 2nd, I'll be going to Crothersville, Missouri, down to the Grizzly Jig Show, and I'll be doing the podcast down there with uh, Brad Chapel, Crappie Connection. 
So if you're going to be anywhere close to uh, Grizzly Jig Company, uh, I'll be there that first day, that Friday. I'm going to take vacation that Friday, and I'm going to take vacation that Monday. I'm going to get down there early Friday and um, do that prop podcast with Brad Chapel. Uh, it's a pre-recorded podcast, so I'm going to get there and do it probably sometime around 4 or 4.30, something like that. And I'm not really sure when Ray will actually play that actual podcast. So, but that's coming up next week. I'm looking forward to doing his podcast. I'm really looking forward to doing Brad Chapel's. Uh, I think that's going to be a good time. Originally from Sykes Symbol. Stop on by Floyd. Uh, I had a, you know, a lot of people that I was, I was going heading down there last year and some things came up and halfway to Springfield, we had to turn around and go back. Uh, so I didn't get to make it down there last year, but I talked to Brad the other day and, uh, we were going to try to, he was pretty sure he'd get me in on that Friday to do that podcast. And he, and it is the same way too. He'll, he'll go down there and do a, a bunch of podcasts and then over the months, uh, post them up on YouTube and all that stuff. So um, Grizzly Jig Show, that's going to be a that's, that's gonna be a fun one. Next week at 105.1 The Bull, that's going to be a fun one too. I've been looking forward to that. Uh, he We first talked about it back in probably November. Deer season came up. Thanksgiving, Christmas, all that kind of got pushed off. So we're going to be doing that show next, next Friday. But yeah, Floyd, if you're pretty close to there, swing by. Stop by and say hi. I have not been to the new store. I haven't been, I've never been down there. I knew about Grizzly Jig from way back to the first time I went to uh, Real Foot Lake. We stopped at a gas station down there and I was looking through some some baits they had and they had Grizzly Jigs, actually Grizzly Jigs, but some hand-tied jigs and the guy there, he's like, you're not going to catch any fish unless you got these jigs. They were made, and they were. They were. I think that guy that opened Grizzly Jig Company started out making those jigs, sold them, and then ended up building up to that big old store. Um, and I heard it's a pretty cool, cool store. I've seen it on YouTube and stuff like that on Facebook. Uh, it looks like one of those places that got just about everything you need. And if they don't got it, you probably didn't really need it. But it looks like a pretty cool store. You should make a jig that looks less. Oh, it's your version of Pergamon. Looks like a carrot. Is that what is that what you mean? Yeah, I heard the place is amazing, Jim. Uh I'm looking forward to that. I've been watching Brad Chapel on the Crappie Connection for a long time. If y'all have not watched Crappie Connection on YouTube, I, I suggest watching it. He has he has a lot of really uh, good information on his podcast. Some of the ones with the uh, the people that fish biologists. He had a podcast with a fish biologist. And I can't think of where that fish biologist was from. I want to say Mississippi. Could he could have even been Tennessee, but he talked about anything and everything about crappie. And this is a guy that would go to lakes and do krill surveys and check the age of them and knew every single thing I'm pretty sure you, a guy could ever know about a crappie. And he explained a lot. You know, of course, people were asking questions. They were asking questions and the one that got me was uh, they asked him how what's the average spawning death for a crappie. Um, and I always thought it was like a foot of water, inches of water. He's but the majority of the crappie will spawn in anywhere between nine to 18 foot of water. And I've, I know I've caught him up on the bank, but I never really thought about going out further and seeing what was out, you know, from those, those areas that they were spawning in. Maybe, maybe the okay ones are up on the bank spawning and the really good ones are, you know, a little further out back that. Uh, Cam Ag, Louie Mansfield started Grizzly Jig in the 90s from his garage. I was there two years ago. I actually met Brad. He's a good dude. Yeah, he's a good dude. I've 
have talked to Brad quite a few times. And actually, I was on the lake one day and we were trolling jigs. And I was like, man, I remember Brad Chapel had that chart on how fast to pull a jig at, to get it to what depth and all that. And it was like a Sunday afternoon. I was fishing. I was trying to get these jigs rigged up. And I was like, I wonder what his was. So I sent him a message. Like five minutes later, he sent me back the the chart on how he done his jigs. And I've kind of based all mine off that. Sometimes I'm a little bit faster, a little bit slower, just kind of depending on where I'm fishing at or how I'm fishing. But that chart he had was was spot on on, you know, if you're trolling an eighth ounce jig at point one mile an hour, this is how deep it'll run. You should make a jig that looks like a carrot. I want to compare my version to yours. It looks like a carrot. I can try that. I'll give it a shot. Melvin Mormon just reposted that interview today. It was a, it was a good interview. I'm telling you, are you you're talking about the one with the wildlife bot with the fisheries biologist? Because that was one of the most in, I got more information about crop and fishing from that one podcast and than just about anything I could think of. That guy knew more about crappie than, I mean, it was crazy. Some of the stuff they were asking him, he knew, you know, how to age a crappie, how to tell how old they are, you know, females versus males, white crappie versus black crappie. Uh, okay, fisheries, biology. yeah, that's right. He was from Oklahoma because he was talking about a lake that I know a guy, that, I know a guy that lives pretty close to one of the lakes he was talking about. And I'd heard that guy, tell me before as we were talking about how small the crappie were in that lake and he actually was talking about that lake for a little bit on what was wrong with that lake and what was going on with it <clears throat> but it was it was a really good interview and brad chapels had several on there like that that are um very informative i'm always i've always been the type that for whatever reason crappie fish got my blood years and years ago and it, it's you always learn something different from them. Even the guys with the live scope, you know, posted those videos on YouTube. Uh, I kind of changed some of my fishing based off what they were saying. They were watching the crappie do on live scope. So I don't have live scope on my boat, but knowing what these guys on YouTube have told me about live scope kind of blended into some of my fishing also. Um, so, you know, the good with the bad, I guess, you know, however you want to say it. I'm not against have a live scope, don't have live scope, but uh, it was a, it, it's, it's a great tool to learn from. There's no doubt about that. Even watching these guys on YouTube use their live scope, you can learn a lot about what crappie do by just watching them, listening to them, and hearing what they got to say about it. And you're absolutely right, Melvin. Brad has created, uh, scroll through some of his videos, send him a message, tell him I sent you there to watch them. But yeah, I I moved my my YouTube live away from. I, I wanted to do mine on Tuesday nights. He was doing his on Tuesday nights. After a couple of times of that, I I like watching his, but I didn't want to take away from any viewers that he might have had going to his show. Uh, so that's one of the biggest reasons I moved mine to Thursday nights because I I like watching Brad Chapel do his. Maybe sometime I can get him on here with me on doing this. Maybe when I go down there, I'll see if I can't get him to do a little bit of a live feed with me. I like old school fishing too, Glenn, a hundred percent. Same exact same way you just phrased it right there. I like watching the stumps come, looking forward, seeing this stump, that stump, that stump, pouring a cup of coffee, uh, running into a, somebody you know or somebody you don't know, and just sitting there shooting the bull with them, you know, while you're fishing, you know, lose an hour of fishing time, just talking to the guys beside you on the boat right next to you. Don't see it. It seems like that's disappearing. I'm excited about all the tagging projects. Imagine what we will know in five or 10 years. Yeah. I think uh, those tagging projects are going to, I think you're going to see some pretty cool information out of it. I think you're going to see crappie that don't, in my opinion, don't roam as much as what people think they they would they do i think crappie would keep themselves in a pretty tight little spot um and they call it home you said you'd be a grizzly jig 
February 2nd. Yeah, I think their show was the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. I think you look it up on Facebook, Grizzly Jig Company. It says what day there's what days their shows are going to be. I know it was like right, probably for sure the first weekend in February. I'm going to leave here that morning, probably, probably around six, um, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I'll get there around noon, something like that. We're going to do that, do that podcast with Brad if he's ready to do it at that time. Then I think. Uh, I'm going to hang around Grizzly Jig for a while, talk to some people that I know that I haven't actually really got to meet yet. And um, then I think after that, they have been showing the moon several miles in a few weeks. Yeah, well, I, I can see that. I can see crappie, but I... I I don't know. I did, it, I've always kind of pictured in my head as they got a stage, a spawning area, a staging area, and then a little further out staging area. <clears throat> and I, I think they stayed close to that. But if they're if they're tracking them and they're moving that far, I mean, you can't can't argue against, you know, the facts. <clears throat> it's fading away. I mean, there's no doubt. But, you know, it's what we all make it. It seems like on YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, all that, it's, it's, it's created a war against people that got it and the people that don't have it. Yeah, I follow Crappie forever. Uh, I was trying to get them. Trying out there last year, I was talking to them about getting a chapter or adding on to the, the Missouri side of it and seeing what I could do about it. And I don't, I can't remember what happened with that. Yep, coon hunting is gone there's you know some people that do it but not like not like they used to uh, but i don't know it's, it's it's what you make it you know we go out in the mornings i always try to get on the lake right as the sun's coming up i want to be i want to be actually i figured out here lately that i'm better off to be waiting until the sky's got some light in it i used to go and put in at 35, 40 minutes before the sun ever even come up and it'd be at my spot when the sun's coming up. But uh, the older I get, the easier it is for me to see the ramp with a little bit of sunlight. Hate it, but it sure helps a little bit. Uh, didn't got out of it. Yeah, I did when I was a kid. My great uncle used to coon hunt a lot and I tagged along on so many coon hunts. And one of those things, I miss it. But at the same time, I don't miss it. Randy Schaefer, I've caught a few with tags that moved two to five miles from where they were released in just a few days during the tournament. That's crazy. Just a few days of a tournament. Hmm. I know I always figured uh, Bucksaw Marina is where almost all the big tournaments are on Truman. And that, well, that's where most of the weigh-ins are. And I always figured that there is a school of monster crappie always somewhere pretty close to Bucksaw Marina up at Truman Lake. I've never caught one with the tag on it, and I really don't think they do it that much in Missouri. I think, well, I think Missouri, some Missouri lakes, I think the saddle limit needs upped. I really don't think it would hurt to take one lake around here and put like an 11-inch size limit on it. Just to see, you know, they put a special slot limit on blue catfish on Truman. I don't know why it wouldn't be to try to target a lake in the state of Missouri as a trophy crappie lake. Even though, I mean, Truman is a good, it's, it's a, absolutely a crappie fish in uh, heaven, especially with some big, big crappie. But I think they could do better with some of their, uh, how they manage the lakes. Not saying they absolutely have to have 11 inches, but hold them all at 10 inches. Some lakes are nine inches, some lakes are 10 inches. Why not just make them all at nine? And actually, if, if the way I make way me and Zach kind of look at it, if we we catch crappie and it looks like it's got to be measured, we usually throw, throw it back. Randy Schaefer, the best one he ever caught 
was worth 10,000, but it would expire just on a look. I remember back in the day, you remember that way back in the day when they used to tag crappie and turn them loose in some of those lakes and they would give those crappie names. I remember seeing that in magazines or I'm pretty sure it was magazines. They used to do that and they would tag them and they'd give that crappie a name and, you know, one be worth a hundred bucks. One might be worth 5,000 bucks. Uh, I can still picture that in my head, those pictures of those cartoon drawings, those crappie with those tags in them. Um, yeah, there's some monster catfish on Truman. Monster catfish. You even, you go to Truman, the way it seems like it usually works is you catch all slot limit fish or you end up catching all under the slot fish. But yeah, Truman, Truman's got some big old fish in it. Truman's a fun like to catch anything, but Truman, Truman's rough, man, on your boat. Old school fishing is the way to go. I got an old 76 foot six fiberglass Zepco rod with Garcia Mitchell 308. Just as old reel, I used to enhance my experience catching them on my hand ties. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, I don't know. And there's, to me, there will always be something about watching that bobber drop underneath the water with the minnow on it. You know, when you, you throw that bobber up, that float up there beside a big dead log, and you reach over to grab your cup of coffee, get a drink, and you look back, and that float's gone. Doug Price from Chattanooga. Ordered my first vice today in Nirvana V2, ready to try my hand at hand time. And be careful with it. It's addicting. I can tell you that right now. I spent many, many hours down here in front of this vice. Uh, it's fun. It's relaxing. Uh, I don't know. I can't explain why it's as relaxing as what it is, but it is. Uh, it's fun. It's there's it, the possibilities are unlimited when you tie your own jigs. You can do whatever color you want, whatever size you want. The hook size you want. Uh, you ain't got to spend a long time looking around a Bass Pro Shop for the right kind of jig. If you think, you know, a certain color works, you can go home and tie that jig. And make it work. Uh, and like I said, that was, that was it. That was the reason I, I started tying was just because I couldn't find the jig I wanted. So I decided to make it myself. So I got on YouTube and watched a few people do it. I watched more fly people time flies than I did crappie jigs to start out with. I'd watch those guys time big streamers and uh, stuff like that. And it, it got me hooked from from the get go. I get to times sometimes where I don't want to do it. I don't want to see another jig. I don't want to hear the word jig hit or vice or and then you know it'll last a week or so and then I'll be right back at it. Uh, he's got a peak vice for jigs and flies. I can't say enough good at anything about the peak vice. I've been I've been using the peak vice. I started out with a cheap one, uh, graduated up to the peak vice. I've never had a moment's problem out of it. Love my peak vice. Jim says he's still learning. That's why he watches Eric. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. And Glenn's outdoors. I know your jigs will catch fish. I, it's, only, it's the only thing I use in my boat. Um, yes, you can spend a fortune on supplies. Um, I, I wish I had a good place to send you where all the, everything was decent price, good price, but, uh, really I pick up a little bit from here. I pick up a little bit from there. Um, uh, I don't really chase down prices. I've chased down more of what I'm looking for, the Chanel I'm looking for. The marabou I'm looking for, a lot of it I get at the Plateau Fly Shop in Springfield. <clears throat> Another place you might want to check on Facebook is Moose Tackle. Uh, send him a message. I think I was getting these quarter-ounce packs of hackle from him. I can't remember the price, but it was a lot cheaper than you'll ever get it anywhere else. Tell him I sent you. Uh, it's Moose Tackle on Facebook. Uh, of course, everybody knows I get all my jig hits from Jason Brummel. You find him on Facebook, Jason's Tackle on eBay. Um, the uh, Hatchet Heads I got from Jay Terry. Find him on Facebook. 
Lens Outdoors. I got some of your jigs in my box and likes them. And Brian Bocho, good day, mate from Australia. I like hearing about all the fishing, especially lure taxi. You blokes use that I may adapt to Aussie fish. Certainly, J. Tanya is one technique not utilized here. I would love to go to Australia and put some of my jigs to work. Uh, I think it would be cool. Go wherever you fish at in Australia and just give them a try and see what happens. Chris Harris tries to watch every video I put out. I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. Randy Schaefer, I use Eric's jigs. That is it. And live bait, I support American Made. Thank you, Randy. And I'm 100% try to buy it. anything I buy. I try to make sure it is American Made. Um, there's no reason a hand tied jig should be getting made in Guatemala and sent back here. I, I totally don't agree with that move that company made. I think there was enough people here in the United States that were doing it that he could have put together a crew, come up with some ideas, and they could have tied them right here. But no, they had to send that to Guatemala or uh, Mexico or wherever it went to. Probably, you know, 10-year-old kids in a sweatshop somewhere tying, tying those jigs or some kind of junk machine doing it. Uh, it just seems wrong. There's a, a crappie jig. I just don't believe that move that company, him and that company made were right. Uh, I, honestly, him getting into the hand tied part of the jigs didn't make any sense other than just corporate greed. Uh, he, they had the market cornered on plastic jigs and why they decided to go after the hand tied jigs is just beyond me. You know, just for no more than making another dollar. Uh, that's my opinion on it. Pretty big name guy with a pretty big name company. Probably know who exactly who I'm talking about, but when I seen that jig on Facebook with its little hand painted, little painted jig head with an eye on it and a neck with some resin or something on it and a couple feathers, just there was there was other ways to do that. I just don't agree with that. Like to see the sport and it not the big money companies. Well, it's not really even. I mean, this big money company is just taking money from everybody that was working in their garage and their own little shops and stuff, sending it to a different country. And people are going to snatch it up. They're going to buy it up because it's cheap. And that logo and that name's on those jigs. Just, I don't know. It's just the way it works, though. We are closing in on one hour, 56 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, all this has also been recorded on and put on Spotify. So if you want to go back and hear something or hear me mention your name on Spotify podcast, Eric Massey Jig Company on Spotify, you can find it there. Travis Williams, hello from Tennessee. Loves watching. Thank you, Travis. I appreciate it. I would like to take a fish too, mate, but had a better off beefing your jigs up both sides of the hooks. Also, we don't have crop. I bet you got fish somewhere that's like a crappie. I bet there's something swimming in your waters that would bite and probably act like a crappie. Order from a little river outfitters in towns in Tennessee, no shipping fee. Really? Huh. I might have to look into that. Little River Outfitters. Well, it's on here. I can go back and watch it again and do that. Um I will be looking them up. Plateau Fly Shop, I'm afraid these guys are totally getting ignored by the big box companies and not getting the orders in that they're supposed to. Uh, and it's got to be killing their business some. I know it is. I went in the other day and their shelves were about empty. Uh, they've been put on the waiting list for their supplies while the big box store down the street gets all their stuff. Um, that was one of the big man taking out, you know, you know, same thing. I can ramble about it all day long. Could probably make a uh, post about it and just go on and on and on. Uh, but I won't. We are going to end this. Uh, like I said, you can go back and you can listen to all this on Spotify if that's what you want to do. I need to actually sit down and make some real, some different Spotify podcasts. And it's kind of hard to come up with an idea Um uh, on how to do a good Spotify without having it all scripted out. If I don't sit down and write it all out, I will talk about, I will start out talking about fishing. By the time we're done, I'm probably talking about my dog running across the street. 
but if y'all got a good idea of what to do on Spotify, let me know. Uh, also, if any of you guys are interested in doing a live with me, send me a message and we'll get on here and we'll just talk back and forth. I'll pick out anybody that's on this list tonight. You send me a message in the next couple of days saying, hey, I want to be on that live with you. Next week, I'll send somebody the link to it and we'll get on there and do it all at the same time. Tommy, thank you for watching. I'm glad you you enjoy my show. Uh, if you haven't yet, hit that like, subscribe, share this video, see how many people we can get in here, and uh, I will see you guys again next Thursday night, and I'm sure there's going to be several videos hit up on YouTube from now until Thursday, so uh, I enjoy doing that, YouTube videos, the shorts and all that. Everyone have a good evening. I hope to catch you in Crestsville, Eric. I will be there. Uh, we'll probably try to get a room reserved somewhere, and I think we're going to go down and stay in Memphis for a night or so. Chris Harris, everybody else, good evening, good night. Y'all be safe. Have a good weekend. A happy New Year's to all of y'all. Be safe. Pick a dozen eight drivers. Stay off the road. Uh, enjoy y'all's long weekend, and I will see you next Thursday.